Ah, I see. You love the blink young con, just like me. <laughs> okay, so let's boot this up. That was a misspelling. <laughs> it's my favorite anime. Okay. Hey everyone, and welcome to I've never done this before. Uh, the audiobook reading stream of the scroll of the blind Yankon. I, I misspelled it in this course, so I said blink Yankon. That is not the canonical name of this book. Uh, but it might be if you want to make like a, a sub, uh, like a, a uh, your uh, your own different head cannon version. It could be a bl the blink cannon. But welcome to everyone who's here. Your Harfiddly D. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that thumbnail has to be the steepest, the most stupid thumbnail I've ever made. Holy shit! Morgic scales universe. Don't at me. <laughs> oh, oh wow, that's a nice. That's a, that's a nice title for something, actually. Okay, but are you guys ready? Uh, is, is the mood set? Should I keep on music or turn it off? What do you guys think? So, I have a wide collection of books here. Just, just imagine that I have a wide collection of books in front of me. I have a wide collection of books here in front of me. And I'll pick this one. Hmm, The Scroll of the Blind Yankon. Seems very, seems very interesting. Keep it. Hey, fan man, nice to see ya. And nice to see you too, Brocket and Saint Shinobi, as always. Okay, so this is the unedited version of the book. Uh, this isn't like... A lot of this may be cut out, maybe changed up a bit. But this is... Um, this is the, uh, the uh, raw version of the book. What? Yeah, yeah, come? What? Oh, I think I said welcome. <laughs> okay, so tell me whenever you're ready, whenever your glasses are filled with uh, delicious liquid and uh, blankets are equipped and you're ready for a story time. Maybe I should have this like fake British accent on the entire time too. Would that make it better or worse? Yeah, okay, I'm not muted. Nice. I, I did that earlier, like last day stream. Got the Ruby kind of multi-galactic strength though. <laughs> yeah, it do be. <laughs> My homework and mental strength is on. Good. Good, that's good to hear. Okay. So I'll just start off the bat. The Scroll of the Blind Yankon. Chapter 1. The Flame That Ignites the Torch. And I won't be looking at chat as regularly because I'll be reading. So, um, close your eyes and dream, like, just... Uh, imagine that you're dreaming about this place. Just try to picture everything and just relax, calm down, and have a nice evening. The late morning sun have already started burning the hot streets of Chaldean. The great city is softly resting beneath the grandiose orb of light that constantly warms the shell of the earth. Hey, Umbudako Damodaira, nice to see you, man. As always, uh, I will not look as at the chat as regularly so um, we just we, we have just started reading the book so uh, close your eyes and and uh, get into the audiobook mode okay I'll, I'll start from the beginning again <laughs> the late morning sun have already started burning the hot streets of Chaldean the great city is softly resting beneath the grandiose orb of light that constantly warms the shell of the earth 
There is an unusual layer of silence covering the main street leading up to the castle of Chaldean itself. Describing the streets as empty would be an overstatement, but there is still little speech, yelling, whispering and bargaining to be heard. The few people outside are most likely ready to close their shops at any moment. The long main street stretches itself across the many shops, keeps and taverns to be found in this district. It eventually stops at the feet of the giant castle where the Emperor, Kyratius III, resides. The castle, with admirable amounts of banners, looms over the city with pride and arrogance. If you were to venture into the main street, you would eventually come across Livanius shields and accessories. Were you to follow the street going past Livanius' shop and turn to the right, you would see a number of old wooden residences. If you were to follow the main street and go in the opposite direction of the castle, you would eventually go through the inner wall and enter the prime square of Lucian. This is the main section, and the largest area of Chaldean city, where trade, business, crime, law and order and public events takes place. I love this city will never be in again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a poor reality. Fuck. Um, yeah. The many streets of the Prime Square cross each other in the center of the city. This is also called Paths Crossing. This is the liveliest part of town where a man of any race, culture or occupation most likely will acquire what he may desire. There are all sorts of shops and attractions there. Anything that could please you, feed you, comfort you, or if you are not careful enough, hurt you. Another attraction you might want to explore while you visit Paths Crossing is the statue of Idenmar one of the Emperor's ancestors from the First Age. The, travel, the travels of Emperor Idenmar tells the tale of how he, in his reign, and I quote, Shiv Valric as he was, fought off the first demon invasion with solace for the poor souls who fell, but nonetheless, nonetheless daringly saved the grace of humanity. At this point, the statue itself is rusting away in paths crossing, without getting the attraction the Emperor's lineage would demand but it's still an artifact of a society we carry the remnants of on our shoulders. So this is the first page. Uh, what do you think so far? Just let me know in the, in the chat. Imagine if the default AID KDR was this detailed. Maybe there'd be a bit of, bit of flesh on those bare bones. <laughs> yeah. yeah, dude. Uh, I feel like this is... There, there, there is a small bit more effort put into this than in the, in the AID universe. Because now I have time to like process everything and just go rampage on these pages. Okay, we shall continue. From a bird's overwatch, the prime square of Lucian is shaped like a circle surrounded by a thick, heavily patrolled stone wall called the Walls of Primus. Three smaller circles are located outside, like this. Okay, so a large circle and then one here and one on the top. Um, yeah. They are all connected to the walls and are equally as spherical. These are the three sub-areas of Chaldean which are located in the southeastern, southwestern and northern part of the city. This sub-area in the southeast is called the Emperor's Street. This is where the Emperor's Castle is located, as well as the Royal Guard and most of the soldiers' houses, making them easily accessible if an accident at the castle were to ever occur. J.R.R. Tolkien. Tolkien is threatened. <laughs> She's pretty good, not gonna lie. Thank you, man. I re really appreciate it. So, uh, um, it's just a very big description of the city. To just set the mood, set the stage. And eventually, things will happen. Okay. Um, yeah. The sub-area in the southwest. Okay, okay, so in the northern, we no, the southeast, we have the Emperor Street. Where the Emperor, the guards, the royal guards, and everyone else involved with the Emperor resides. The sub-area in the uh, southwest is the Archbishop's area, home to the Great Church of Ayas, a sacred building dedicated to Ayas, the god of intellect and the oldest one of the Twelve Gods. He is the primary god within Chaldeonic faith and has been the most represented religious figure since the First Age. The Great Church of Ayas is driven by Archbishop Mendelan, the Emperor's youngest sibling. The church is inhabited by over 100 pious monks, who dedicated every part of their life and being to Ayas and Mandelan. The northern sub-area of the city is called the Academics Ward. This part of the city contains 
uh, all schools, academies, training grounds and recruitment barracks for anyone who is pursuing an occupation out of the ordinary, soldiers, scholars and priests alike. Even though the dis oh, stuttering. Even though this district of the city is home to all sorts of schools and academies, the upper class have also taken themselves the privilege of occupying the area with their flamboyant and bombastic houses, settling down in a district that's supposed to be used primarily for knowledge and study. The prime square is the area where the common folk lives. The streets are not as lively as they were the week before, when the Empress Day festival took place. That's the only time of the year where the lower class and upper class alike appreciate the existence of the Emperor and his lineage. This, naturally, is not because of their gratitude towards the Emperor. The town folk love this day so dearly because the price for bee and wine is lowered severely. The Emperor Caracius likes to keep himself in his castle without a need to communicate with the citizens at all. His son, Laurentius, is different. He's a lovely blonde chap who likes to play games with the children, compliment the women and share a beer with the men. However, this is most likely to feed his own egotistical nature and make him the center of attention. The royal princess, Ulvondana, is the complete opposite of her brother Laurentius. She loves to hide in the shadows, play pranks and laugh at anyone who is worth laughing off, which is ironic considering how she has her father's looks and is therefore nicknamed the royal mule. Ha ha ha. Her nose is long and bent, her hair tangly and reddish, and her eyes as callous as a thief. Fortunately, she's married off to the Forangers, one of the independent northern kingdoms, in order to create an alliance between the two royal houses. So that is the description. That is the whole description of the city. Whenever I feel like my writing is shit, I start writing things on a separate app without the AI, letting myself take in initiative and my confidence is restored. Sort of the same for this. <laughs> yeah, I see what you mean. This is the level of environment detail I want to achieve, since I struggle so hard with describing the world around a character that I often give up and really shouldn't. Dude, I feel like you are one of the best like independent writers that I uh, that I have like met and talked to. I feel like you have a very good talent in writing. Um, so I feel like you have achieved a lot. Royal Mule Mao. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now let's get to my favorite part. Inside one of the houses past Lavinia's shield and accessories within the Emperor Street, a man is stripping his dark leather cuirass tightly to his chest. He thrusts his feet inside his worn-out leather boots and tightens his belt around his waist to hold everything together. He looks out of his window, gazing at a bright mass of sunlight forcing itself into his bedroom. His long, slender body is a bit too tall for the window, but somehow the sun keeps blocking his view. His hair is the color of silver but I would dare to say even brighter. It's a couple months too short to reach his shoulders, but it runs down his neck and behind his ears in a clean and orderly way. His eyes are bright blue when bathed in sunlight, but as soon as he moves towards the shadows in the corner of the room, the true blue tone to his eyes reveal themselves. Galder my king, yeah, let's go! Not even five minutes and I died. Oh what, I joined some game my friend sent me and in the first minute of joining I got ganged up by a couple of military people. No man, I feel so sorry. <laughs> Google Dark Leather Curious and Galder has never looked more badass. Oh man, I'm glad to hear. I'm glad to hear the Galder hype. Above his right eye a scar is to be seen, covered with layers of his pale skin. His nose is straightforward, somewhat charmless. His mouth, thin, maybe even a bit too small compared to the length of his face. He puts one hand on his long sword. It's long but thin, about 120 centimeters, seethed on his back. The man opens his door and locks it tightly before venturing into the streets. He has one simple task for the day, finding a job to do. The silver-haired man is no ordinary innkeeper or farmer. He is a bounty hunter, quest searcher, whatever you would call it these days. There is an unsettling atmosphere brewing in the continent of Kedar these days. Something unexplainable. Galder have no business within this problem. He's just a simple bounty hunter for hire. Nothing more, nothing less. However, Galder wouldn't mind investigating this strange atmosphere, and most importantly, what caused it. The years he spent as a warden for the Emperor really paid off. He climbed the ladder of independence and has now reached a point in his life where he can provide for himself by doing tasks and quests for the Emperor, the gods, or just the kingdom itself. Sorry for not commenting much, typing on phone, 
not an- Oh, okay, no, that's all good, man. Just kick back and relax. Galdor can be bringing you in warm or cold. Yeah, dude. Yeah. You don't want to mess with Galdor, man. <laughs> okay. Where were we? Um, meeting the Emperor was certainly an important experience for him. But alas, his life has strayed further away from the life of a royal guard. He's a wanderer. That's not in his nature anymore. After strolling down the street from his home and turning right, he proceeds to stroll past Livinius and further down the cobbled road. His gaze moves over to the largest inn at the main street, the Jollyful Jester. He looks at a wooden sign depicting a hideous jester with a large grin. Beneath it is a large wooden door which releases a tinge of damp and sweaty air every time a new customer opens it. Galdi ignores the door and walks straight past it to the large and empty quest board. The board is supposed to show every wanted criminal or animal in the nearby area, which most likely is a threat to the Empire. These posters are the ground pillar in Galdi's line of work. Without a target, he is without food. He looks over it, carefully examining all post posters, but unfortunately everyone is as uninteresting as one another. He examines all of them a second time in hope of finding something he may have overlooked. That's when his eyes notice a poster saying the following. Blue Bashar, seen in the desert of Talimar, wanted for Ill illegal and maintained trade across the border. Galdr sighs and leaves it at the board. He tries one last time to examine all of them yet again. His stomach growling as he searches through all the uninteresting convicts he may have to force himself to find. Eventually he comes across another one who reads, Wanted for questioning, Garrod, on the run from the Empire, as he was spotted in the city of Kahar. Galda grabs the worn out parchment. Oh, everything okay? I just saw the screen refresh itself. Okay, I hope everything is good. My, um... Umpedako, I will pay you if you can successfully type a sentence in landscape on phone with no typos and no deleting and rewriting. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? <laughs> I hope the stream is going okay. Because I'm getting like warning. Stream lagged for a nanosecond. Oh, okay, 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 good, good. Well, I, I hope it's I hope it's bearable. Okay. Uh, yes. Wanted for questioning Garrett on the run from the Empire as he was spotted in the city of Gahar. Galdo grabs the one-out parchment, describing the details of the mission. He shoves the poster into his leather satchel and looks around. Gahar it is then, he mutters, with a sigh as he starts heading for the city gates. Okay, so is the, is the stream going alright? Is it like, I think the quality has been lowered, but you can see me, hear me, everything. I hope. Let's just check, I'm gonna do some... Maintenance, be right back. All is well, all is good. Thank you so much. I think, yeah, I think everything is all well and good. Nice. Okay, shall we continue? Are everything, are everyone comfortable? Everything's all right? Okay, uh, yeah. The city gates which towers over him quickly opens as the guards see Galdr approaching it. Safe travels, ya hear? Put your warden skills to use now, friend. One of the guards says to him with a smile. I will. Thanks, Rodney. At least one of us got a stable career after graduating. Galdr responds, waving as he walks through the gates closing behind him. He watches the landscape thoroughly. The farmers have locked their doors for the night, and almost everyone is out of sight. Galda moves past the fields. They have started developing a golden tangerine color, almost reflecting the sun which is now casually going down behind the woodlands at the outskirts of Caldion. The sun moves quickly in the autumn, and is rapidly replaced by an obscure moon, carefully providing a chill breeze. Galda prefers the crisp wind rather than the warmth of spring. His hometown, Boldingbrook, used to be quite hot in the summer. That's one of the reasons he moved to Caldion after all. That and his line of work. Past Galdor, you are Galdor, a male human warden. Future Galdor, I'm about to end this man's whole career. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I love that we're so familiar with Galdor's character and story. 
Like, we, we know what's about to go down. <laughs> These guys, yeah. A sad fate. As he crosses the Celtic Bridge, he is soon approached by an immersive wildlife. The sound of the trees is echoing in the deep forest next to the path leading north. There are still a few houses by the road, and one of the one of them catches his attention, as it's clearly out of place. The door is wide open, with no lights to be seen through the windows. He notices a strong smell of rot, rot and bark. The smell is getting heavier as he approaches it. Galda grabs the hilt of his sword, slowly unsheathing it stealthily. He leans towards the wall and follows it until he is close enough to peek inside the house. The table, chairs, cooking pots and candles are spread out everywhere across the wooden floor. A carpet is resting on the floor. Its patterns resembles a regular linen Talimarian carpet from the south. One of the candles is still barely lit and its flames manage to ignite the carpet, setting it on fire in an instant. Galda's eyes widen as he rushes in to stomp it, but he's too slow. The fire is spreading rapidly, and he looks around for anything valuable worth saving if the family owning this lodge were to come back. That's when he notices the wooden door to the left, barely open. He thrusts his finger into the tight gap and pulls it open, only to reveal a family of five in the corner and a large creature in front of them. The creature is made of wood, and is just standing there, menacingly, obviously threatening the family with its intimidating presence. Its body is rotten and morbid, the eyes black, and from the top of its head spring several branches out in all directions. Wooden golems, hearing Chaldean, Galda whispers to himself. The golem produces a gurgling sound from its mushy mouth as it bolts towards Galda. He brings forth his sword, holding it steady with both hands. He dashes forward with a swift movement, slashing at the golem's chest as he rolls away and quickly gets up on his feet again. It lets out a horrifying scream, enough to make the children and the parents protect their ears. Galda struggles with focusing as the scream gets louder every second. Uh, he blinks twice and breathes out. New Jojo stand, wooden golem. <laughs> I love it, dude. Oh, nice. Uh, combat is something I'm heavily interested in seeing you write alone. Yeah, that's yeah. This will be my my test, and I hope I'll graduate. This idea inspired me to rewrite some of my earlier pieces, which were of the quality of a seven-year-old fanfic writer and makes me cringe looking back on. Well, if you rewrite it, it, it may become a really, really great work. Like, help, somebody help! Okay, wait. Um, I'm dying. Is it more stable now? Let's see. Yeah, it's 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 uh, it's an issue. 